Well, how else do you learn other than by making mistakes? So, all right, I'm going to- That is true. That is focus. true. You do not learn from success. You only learn from failure. True. In that case, uh, the U.S. seems to be in, a, in very good stead right now. Oh, yes, we're learning a lot. <laughs> but, and we should be, anyway. Um. <clears throat> All right, here, let me just get this set up. So the, the people who are asking the, the first questions, if you want to just kind of move over, or you can just move over later. All right. So uh, Ambassador Freeman, welcome to uh, Hong Kong virtually, uh, and welcome to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Right. So uh, this, this class here is uh, learning about US political economy and foreign policy. Uh, and we are in the Masters of Global Political Economy program at CUH. Right. So the, the whole purpose of the program, it was, it was started after the great financial crisis. And the idea was that uh, academic uh, economics did a pretty poor job of warning people about the potential of a crisis. And it left people very unprepared. So the idea behind this program was to, to provide a more uh, uh, organic, more broad-based, interdisciplinary uh, approach to global political economy to try to avoid, to try to prepare the next generations uh, better to, to see uh, future crises, et cetera. So a lot of it was from failures in the economics uh, discipline, which leads me directly to my first question to you, because uh, I've heard you criticize international relations theory for its over-reliance on deductive reasoning. So, you know, starting from first principles like anarchy and then reasoning downward, uh, as opposed to inductive reasoning, uh, doing empirical investigations first and then building up your theory from there. Or, you know, as you would, you could also say, seeking truth from facts, right? Um, you've suggested that this has had the effect of making US foreign policy over-reliant on military power and give short shrift to diplomacy. So what would you say to advise this generation of students who are currently learning IR theory? Well, um, I'm not an expert on IR theory, but I note uh, that it was developed largely through funding by the U.S. Defense Department. Um, Schelling and other game theorists uh, come out of that tradition. Um, uh, the Defense Department spends, has spent billions of dollars creating an academic discipline that focuses on the use of coercive measures against other states. Uh, there's been no comparable effort uh, to explore uh, incentives or um, in, inducements to other states to change their behavior. And we all know in ordinary life, uh, you do not begin a discussion with someone else by pulling out a gun. Uh, the famous uh, American, Italian American gangster Al Capone did say on one occasion that uh, you can get uh, quite a ways with the word of kindness, but if you have, if you add a gun to it, you will get farther, um, which may <laughs> be true. But um, the, the ordinary life teaches us that relationship management cannot depend on threats. Uh, and yet that is exactly what IR theory primarily examines. And um, uh, so um, there's a further problem. Um, in the United States, which has been the cradle of IR theory, um, the uh, in, in, and uh, and the phenomena I just mentioned, um, uh, there has been um, uh, no professionalization of the diplomatic service, or an ad inadequate uh, professionalization. A, a profession is uh, an activity uh, in which. Uh, an expert professes expertise. Uh, he or she says, I have a body of knowledge. I have access to a doctrine which will help me perform the tasks that are assigned to me. So, uh, you know, if you're a tax lawyer, that's a profession. Uh, you profess to know the tax law and you profess to know accounting and you, and you profess to be able to resolve questions relating to taxes. If you're a professional diplomat, you profess to be able to manage international relationships to the advantage of your own country, but also 
in such a way as to preserve an international environment that is conducive to your own country's welfare. Um, so um, in the United States, uniquely to this day, uh, the upper ranks of the diplomatic uh, avocation, not profession, uh, the, 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 the upper ranks uh, go to um, campaign donors, uh, people with no known qualifications for the jobs they're going into. That's uh, probably a product of a quirk in the American uh, constitutional system. Uh, coming out of our War of Independence, the Constitution bans uh, the conferral of titles of nobility. So you can't be Sir somebody or other or Lord whatever uh, in the United States. And Benjamin Franklin, who was our first ambassador to London after independence, um, set the stage by declining to be addressed as Your Excellency. He said, I am Mr. Ambassador. I'm not Your Excellency, the Ambassador. Um, so there was a Republican simplicity that, with which we began. Well, if you can't have titles of nobility, the next best thing is to get an ambassadorship. Because if you are an ambassador, you carry that title for life. Rather like a general, a general, when a general retires, uh, he or she is still a general. Uh, so um, this is coveted because of its prestige, the nomenclature and so on. You know, if you, if you have enough money to buy a Ferrari, why not buy an embassy? Um, so um, all of this uh, means that the United States uh, tends to rely on deductive reasoning, as you said, um, from a theory that was hatched in universities, which is several removes from the real world, um, where uh, you have to do something that um, was very common uh, and, and it was the, the essence of the early US-China relationship, namely establish a personal relationship with your counterpart and compartmentalize that relationship so it is not affected by the official interactions you have to have. I'll give you an illustration if that's of relevance. I used to go in as Chargé, um, or um, as, uh, as the minister at the embassy in Beijing in the early 80s, and I go into the foreign ministry to speak with either the vice minister or assistant minister. And typically we would um, slouch down in those overstuffed chairs that they like in Beijing and um, re relax. And I would say to my counterpart, you know, how did your kid do on that exam last week? Or did you see the movie we talked about? Uh, or, you know, uh, what are your travel plans? You, uh, um, and so forth and so on. And he or she, usually he in, in those days would come back at me uh, with similar questions. And after about five minutes, we would look at each other and both of us would pull ourselves up straight in the chair, put both feet on the ground, our hands on our knees. And I would say, for example, I have been instructed by my government to protest in the very strongest terms, the absolutely outrageous behavior of China in the Persian Gulf. You are selling missiles to the Iranians, which they are using to damage shipping and disrupt the world's oil supply. No country with, with, a, with a serious interest in world peace could possibly do what you are doing. And my counterpart would then say, I categorically reject everything you have said. It's all nonsense and so forth and so on. And we would go back and forth like this. And then at some point we would look at each other and say, well, have we done our, what we need to do? And um, if the answer was yes, we would slouch back into the chairs. And I would say, how about a picnic at the Shisanding um, this weekend? Uh, so um, this is diplomacy in action. It is a political performance art 
not captured in theory? Sorry, long-winded answer, but uh, maybe of interest. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, it's, it's funny, when I just graduated, uh, uh, somebody brought their, their father into NYU to talk about uh, being a diplomat, and he was just a, uh, an oil executive who was appointed by George W. Bush to become the, the Saudi ambassador, or the ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And he described how he didn't really know that much about you know, the, the country, its history, et cetera. So they brought him to think tanks in DC for a two week uh, sort of last minute cramming session. Before right, right. That's what they do. Now, um, my, my practice, I served uh, in a remarkably wide number of arenas. I began my career in India. Uh, I learned Tamil, which I have now totally forgotten, thank God. I mean, if I had ever let the State Department know that I spoke Tamil, I would have spent my entire career commuting between Chennai and Colombo. And maybe if I were well behaved, I'd get to go to Singapore for a while. But um, uh, started out in, uh, I read everything I could on India. I learned uh, local language. Um, I did the same everywhere else. I, I learned uh, Mandarin and Taiwanese both in in Taiwan. Um, I uh, my family gave up English for a year and a half um, and spoke nothing but Chinese. Um, and the at home uh, and um, I was then assigned to Thailand. Uh, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, uh, Bill Casey, who was the head of the CIA, uh, arrived in. Bangkok on a plane from Beijing, where he had, for some un unknown reason, entered the country with a red wig. Um, but he was there to confer with the Chinese intelligence services on various cooperative programs that we had during the Cold War. He arrived in Bangkok, and the foreign minister, Sit Sawitsila at that time, uh, was a former OSS agent, the OSS being the World War II predecessor of the CIA. He'd been active in the resistance against the Japanese during World War II, and he loved the CIA. So he invited Mr. Casey to dinner, but he also knew that Mr. Casey and the then ambassador, John Gunther Dean, did not get along. So he did not invite the ambassador, he invited me, and I had arrived in Thailand four days previously. Uh, Casey mumbled. He was very hard to understand. And uh, so what happened uh, was we were sitting at the table. There was the, China, the Thai foreign minister, the head of foreign intelligence, the head of the counter and narcotics uh, unit, the general dealing with the Cambodian uh, issue uh, and Vietnam, and the national security advisor, five people, four on our side. Um, the station CIA station chief, me, the deputy CIA director, and Mr. Casey. And um, the Thai found Casey boring and incomprehensible, so they began to speak in Thai to each other. And the Americans began to speak in English to each other. So there were two separate conversations going on. And I looked across the table and I realized I you know, when I was in Beijing, I understood everything that was going on around me. Now, I couldn't, I didn't know whether they were discussing how to chop me up and serve me over noodles uh, or something uh, more constructive. And so I decided I would learn Thai. And I spent a year, I got up every morning at 6.30 in the morning and had a, an hour and a half of tutoring in Thai. And after a year, I could get up and give a speech in it. Um, and Casey came back, same group, Yuan Ban Ren Ma, same group, uh, same scene, same outcome. Everybody starts talking in Thai on one side of the table and the, an English on the other. And this time I can understand the Thai. So what do you think they were talking about? No clue. Boxing, women, golf, drinking. <laughs> um, the sort of stuff you could hear in a bar anywhere in the world. And I, look, I thought to myself, my God, you know, I killed myself for a year. <laughs> so I could listen to this drivel. Uh, anyway, um, I also uh, later learned Arabic and um, uh, for the same reason, uh, just for situational awareness. 
Um, so I would argue that there are two, there's a number of things that a professional brings to the job that an amateur cannot. One is experience with how to prepare. Another is language ability. Another is attention to cultural differences. Um, another is the mechanics of diplomacy. When do you send a first person note? When do you send a note verbal? When, what is an aid memoir? Uh, what is a non-paper? All sorts of little tricks of the trade. Uh, none of which uh, amateurs know, and they can't learn that, all this in two weeks. Uh, so I think the United States, which has had a tremendous margin for error in the post-war era, when we became act post-World War, post, uh, War II era, when we first became active in world affairs, uh, has now run out of the margin for error. Um, and there are going to be um, incidents of incompetence um, that will force us to do what everyone else has done, uh, namely to turn to professionals. And here I'd say a word about the Chinese Foreign Service. Uh, when I first met the Chinese Wajiaquan, they were uh, they were like tarantulas. Uh, I don't know if you have any experience with tarantulas. I think you have them in Hong Kong. Um, but they always travel in pairs. You know, um, there's, if you find one, there's always another. Um, and these guys were, you know, looking, were surveilling each other. And if one of them stepped out of line and deviated from the line, the Lu Xian, then uh, that person would be reported. Or would, the other guy would write a Xiao Bao Gao, and that would be the end of it. Uh, anyway, um, and they were very rigid, and and they spoke as though to foreigners as though they were Chinese, not foreigners. Um, so they weren't very effective. I have watched that service professionalize. Um, you know, they are very, very good. Um, they, they have the languages, they have the cultural sensitivity, uh, they have the, the, the techniques down. Uh, they're now allowed to free will a little bit. Uh, so they come out individually. Um, and I have great uh, respect for that, uh, uh, that service. Uh, so I would argue that diplomacy is a craft. Um, if you, it's a skilled job. And if you want to do a skilled job, you need a skilled worker, not an amateur. Uh, just to make your argument perfectly unimpeachable, you mentioned the first ambassador to the UK. The, the last one was a guy, I think Woody Johnson, who is also the owner of the New York Jets. And yes. if the way that he conducted diplomacy is anything than like the way he's, he's uh, ruled the Jets over the past few years, then uh, God help us. Um, well, that's are... interesting. You know, actually in London, the tradition is that the ambassador kisses babies and cuts ribbons and goes to parties and gives them. And the DCM, the deputy chief of mission, uh, Fu Guanzhang, um, or charge in the absence of the ambassador, does all the serious diplomatic work. So uh, Ray Seitz, um, who had been DCM minister uh, in London and had done all the diplomatic work, became the first and so far the only professional ever given the job of ambassador to the court of St. James. And uh, the British were beside themselves. What do we do now? Now we have an ambassador who knows what he's doing and could carry on the normal work of an ambassador. How do we deal with this? And they went to ambassador Seitz and he said, oh, carry on with the number two. I'm going to have fun. <laughs> Fair enough. So I've, I've got a, a more difficult uh, question uh, coming up next. So th just to, to, to be fair to some IR theorists, you've got some good ones as well. Um, Mark Lacey and Anatole Levin have recent, recently written about uh, climate change and how that changes the way that, that international relations should be conceived. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating to see people who call themselves realists not look at this, uh, the, the greatest problem we're facing and treat it seriously. So I'm, I'm wondering if you were uh, advising both the, the US and Chinese governments on how to cooperate on the ecological crisis we face of which climate change is a significant part, 
Um, what would you advise them as a, as a way to, to cooperate on the fundamental restructuring of the global economic system that we need for you know, a sustainable civilization? Oh, very complicated, very timely question. Um, uh, let me say first, I think climate change is a subset of a wider range of problems. How to manage the global commons, uh, how to deal with planet-wide issues. Uh, these might include pandemics as well as climate change. They might include um, the depletion of natural resources like fish, which are being uh, fished out uh, and uh, are in danger of extinction in some cases. How does the world cooperate to deal with these problems? At the moment, it's not dealing with them uh, very effectively. Uh, the bilateral U.S.-China interaction is very important, obviously, for the simple reason that we are the number one and number two emitters of greenhouse gases. I think the Chinese would also point out that U.S. was busily emitting greenhouse gases for the last 200 years, uh, while China was not, um, and that somehow this historical legacy needs to be factored into whatever we do. Um, so uh, what would I advise the two, the two governments or the U.S. government? Um, uh, very simply, um, return to relationship management. Stop insulting the other party. Um, end the diatribe. Um, Bismarck once said, in my view very correctly, that one should always be polite even when delivering a declaration of war. Um, we are not polite. We have on the U.S. side, we've just had a Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, who was uh, insufferably rude uh, and accusatory. Uh, the wolf warrior diplomacy of Charlie Chen and others on the Chinese side is exactly the same. Uh, it offends, it does not persuade. So we need to return to a dialogue focused on persuasion rather than scoring points for domestic political purposes, which is where we are now. That's the, the basic requirement. And I agree, therefore, with some of the statements that uh, Beijing has made, including Mr. Zhao, um, uh, that um, it's not realistic to expect cooperation uh, when you um, approach the other party uh, with threats and confrontation and insults. And this is particularly the case, uh, I think, with China, given the problem of Mianza or face. Um, we have a comparable issue in American culture, which is called honor. Uh, but um, if you insult um, Chinese the way we are, um, uh, you can often get a very irrational uh, reaction. Uh, so this is not a basis for cooperation. Beyond that, um, I think the climate change issue um, is, a, is, another, is also a very interesting one for a number of other reasons. One, um, in some of the key technologies, let's say technologies for renewable energy to reduce the requirement to burn fossil fuels, uh, are in technologies in which China now has the lead. Uh, so the technology flow should be from China to the United States and elsewhere. Um, but this is contrary to the usual American uh, arrogant assumption that we have everything to offer and no one else does. Um, so second, uh, this is really less a government, a problem that government can tackle uh, than it is one that has to be addressed by corporate entities and private uh, private investors. So, for example, uh, we're all concerned about carbon dioxide, CO2 emission. What um, prevents us, the, the, what, what, it, what is economically um, uh, wrong about the way we treat this is uh, we propose to do sequestration to take carbon dioxide out of an industrial process or out of the atmosphere and stick it back in the earth. There's no economic advantage to that whatsoever. The only way you will ever 
get uh, effective management of carbon dioxide is if you turn it into a valuable commodity that people can make money from by collecting and using. Well, it turns out that there are technologies, I'm actually involved with one and I will uh, it, it disclose my interest, um, trying to introduce a technology which is actually operational in New Jersey at the moment to China. Uh, this is a technology that replaces water in making concrete and cement with CO2, with carbon dioxide. So you save water, you lock up the carbon dioxide in the concrete for 150 years. Um, you um, uh, produce a concrete that is tougher and cheaper. And um, instead of a normal concrete, um, probably someone in the audience in the class knows something about concrete. Normally, if you, if you do use the so-called Portland cement uh, method, which was invented in England a couple of hundred years ago, then you, you, um, you have to cure the concrete for about 28 days. Uh, that is the water has to evaporate out of it in order, in order for it to harden. Um, this uh, carbon dioxide based uh, concrete cures in eight hours. Uh, so it's a tremendous saving of energy and um, as well as uh, a climate. And I'm, our estimate is that if China adopts this technology, it could cut in three or four years, it could cut the greenhouse gas emissions from its concrete industry uh, in half. And since those are 28% of China's emissions, that's a 14% reduction in emissions in a very short time. Uh, so what is the key here? The key is to find economic incentives for investors, for uh, companies, uh, for, for technologists uh, to solve the problem by taking the, car the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it to use. Uh, there's also technology, I'm not invested in this, um, which, uh, by which you use uh, carbon dioxide to make fuel, gasoline. Um, this would end the practice of um, using uh, corn for uh, maize for um, biological um, additives to, to gasoline, uh, eth um, ethylene. Um, of course, a lot of farmers in the United States don't want to see that happen, uh, but it's a technology that proves the concept that if you can make carbon dioxide valuable economically, people will find ways to profit from that. So my bottom line here is the two governments uh, have two responsibilities. One is to harmonize, or maybe three responsibilities. One is to harmonize policies, to incentivize solutions for the problem. Um, and um, perhaps if we cannot do that, uh, they need to cooperate in research and development on geoengineering, uh, which may be the last, last way of dealing with this issue. But they also have a responsibility to facilitate rather than impede scientific cooperation. Um, at the moment, um, scientific cooperation is becoming more difficult as a result of national security restrictions. Um, this is foolish in part because China has eight times the number of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians, or so-called STEM or STEM workers, now that the United States does and cutting ourselves off from uh, this pool of Chinese talent uh, is foolish. Uh, so we need to re reduce rather than increase barriers to collaboration among scientists. And, and finally, uh, we need to avoid stupid moves like banning the import of solar grade silicon from Xinjiang uh, so that we can't produce solar panels in the United States. Uh, China produces 80% of the world's solar grade uh, silicon and a lot of it is produced in Xinjiang. So we need to um, 
We need to confer, we need to consult, we need to agree to facilitate cooperation. But frankly, the two governments are less important in this, uh, except as, as sort of scene setters for the private sector and the Chinese corporate sector to work together. All right, well, I've, I've got uh, a whole bunch of questions on from myself, but that would take far too long. So let's get to uh, some student questions. Uh, Shinya and Matthew, you had uh, uh, two related questions about uh, US Afghanistan policy. Would you mind just uh, coming up and, and speaking them into the microphone? Thank you. I have it printed out here if you want to read. <laughs> Yeah. Good, good morning. Good evening. <laughs> uh, I have one question um, for Afghanistan and the U.S. government. Is Does the U.S. government's mil military force withdraw from Afghanistan mean that its strategy of using force to resolve national security issues is basically over? I wish it did, it, it doesn't. Um, so um, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, Afghanistan, um, uh, the, the American invasion of Afghanistan, of course, followed a terrorist attack on New York and Washington uh, by uh, Al Qaeda, uh, which was foreign Arab resident, uh, Arab residents of Afghanistan. Uh, interestingly, uh, the plan was hatched in Afghanistan, but the training for it uh, took place in the United States and the uh, rehearsal of it, uh, the, the detailed planning was done in Germany. So this is a typical multinational uh, project. Um, the United States intervened in Afghanistan for a good reason, and we had two objectives. One was uh, to capture or bring to justice uh, the architects of the terrorism, Al Qaeda, meaning Osama bin Laden and others. Um, and uh, second, to punish the Taliban regime, uh, which had given safe haven to these people, so that they would never again offer a home to terrorists with global reach. We accomplished that very quickly. Uh, by the end of 2001, two, two months through three months, early January 2002, we had overthrown the Taliban government. Uh, we had captured or killed most of the Al Qaeda operatives. Uh, we missed getting uh, Osama bin Laden, who went into hiding in Pakistan, as we now know. Um, at that point, there was no real discussion. Uh, but the objectives morphed, they changed. Uh, they went from this rather simple, uh, let's raid Afghanistan and accomplish these two purposes, uh, to a broader program of nation building, pacification, democratization, and so forth and so on. Uh, now, if I were an Afghan, um, I'm not, um, I would take great pride in my history because for 2,500 years, no foreign invader has ever been able to destroy my freedom as an Afghan. Uh, you know, we foreigners may not like some Afghan cultural habits, uh, but the Afghan, that's for the Afghans to decide. Uh, so Alexander the Great invaded and was de de defeated. Uh, the uh, Indians and the British invaded and were defeated. Um, and uh, the Soviets invaded and were defeated, uh, and uh, the Americans invaded and were defeated. We should learn from this that there are severe limitations to what the use of force can accomplish. Uh, the great French diplomat Talleyrand once said, you can do anything with a bayonet except sit on it. And um, the uh, we, in effect, tried to sit on a bayonet in Afghanistan. Um, now, there's a theory, this is back to IR theory, uh, there's a theory by someone named McKinder uh, that if you control 
the center of what he called the world island, meaning Eurasia, uh, you can command the world. Um, if that theory had any validity, if it, and it was the basis of the so-called great game, uh, then Afghanistan is the booby prize in the, in the great game. And we just won it. Um, I think there is widespread recognition in the United States that the use of force has severe limitations. The military have always understood this. It's the civilians who have exaggerated what the use of force can do. Uh, I sat many, many times in the situation room at the White House over the course of my career, and I can attest to you that there is no one so bloodthirsty as a civilian in search of a military solution to a problem. Uh, the soldiers know that they could die or their comrades could die uh, on the battlefield. The civilians can sit at home and watch video reports on what's going on. Uh, so I'm hoping uh, that your question, uh, that the answer to your question may eventually be yes, but for the time being, it is not. Mm. Uh, Lanchon? Got a, a question about uh, US European diplomacy now. Mm -hmm. I have to print it up for you if you want, or you can just. Good morning. Um, what do you think of the. I can't hear you. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, what do you think of the new transatlantic data transfer agreement that Biden was to reach today after present in 2013? So the, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. What was the, uh, the, the prism revelations that uh, uh, stood oh, in oh, oh, oh. and the recent transatlantic data agreement that Biden is trying right, to... Right, right, right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I wish I knew more about digital uh, issues than I do. Um, uh, Europe has a very comprehensive and I think quite admirable focus on privacy in, uh, in digital communication. Um, the United States uh, during the Cold War uh, became very predatory in our listening ability. Um, we monitor communications, but we're not the only ones, by the way. Um, having served in Beijing, I can tell you that um, uh, you know, I couldn't hiccup um, in my apartment without being heard by someone. In fact, there, uh, there was a, quite an interesting incident, which I'll tell you uh, about. Um, so um, uh, I, I would like to see the United States return to the practice that we had uh, before World War II of um, looking to the world for best practices that we could adopt. I would like to see us be more respectful of our allies in terms of eavesdropping. Uh, but we live in a world that, um, in which many countries have these capabilities and abuse them. Um, uh, so the story is this. Um, at the end of 1981, after a period in which I had been in charge of the US Embassy in Beijing, my new ambassador arrived. He had been in Pakistan previously um, and had been put on the enemy list of the Iranian uh, government. So one day I was, I think it was, yes, Christmas Eve, 1981. I was at the embassy and I got a visit from Chinese intelligence. Um, and they said, um, we're sorry to tell you that there is a four-man hit team who came in from Pyongyang, via Pyongyang from Iran, whose mission is to kill your ambassador or blow up your embassy or something. And they have actually managed to enter your embassy on a pretext. They didn't get very far in, but we have spotted them on roofs around your embassy uh, doing research on how to act. And so I said, well, thank you for telling me this. Um, um, may I, may I uh, assume that you are watching them? They said, yes. Um, 
They, they cannot even fart in the Iranian embassy without our hearing it. I said, okay. So I went to see the ambassador. I said, here's what's happened. He said, what do you think we should do? I said, I, my advice is it's Christmas Eve. Let's give everybody the day off so there's no concentration of people in the embassy. Let's rent a couple of tour buses and put them in front of the gate so you can't drive a truck through with explosives. Let's enjoy Christmas, see what happens, and, um, uh, and, and, and deal with it later. And um, so he thought that was a good idea, and we did that. I stayed at the embassy very late because I, have, I was working. Everybody else left. About 5, 30, 6 o'clock, I went home uh, to my apartment in Sanitar. And um, the, uh, no sooner did I get in than my neighbor uh, in the building, who was the Iranian charge, he'd just, been, he'd just had a new ambassador arrive too, so he was now the number two. Somebody that wasn't, I wasn't supposed to talk to, he wasn't supposed to talk to me, but we rode in the same elevator and once in a while we'd be at the same um, dinner. And so, you know, I'm polite. He was polite. So we knew each other. I walk into my apartment, the phone rings, and it's this Iranian diplomat. And he says, Chaz, uh, I, I just, I want to apologize. I just, I know it's Christmas. I meant to send you a Christmas card, but I can't do it. Um, and uh, he said, uh, I, I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. And I said, Ahmed, you know, um, I didn't expect this. It's very kind of you to call. And he said, well, some people are saying that you think there's an Iranian terrorist group here that wants to blow up your embassy or kill your ambassador. And I said, Ahmed, I don't know where you hear these strange stories. And he said, oh, well, that's what everybody's saying. And I just wanted to call you and tell you that you personally have nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is the Iranian sense of humor. So I said, well, thank you very much. I'm sure my ambassador will be greatly relieved to hear that. And, um, I, and we hung up and I called the ambassador. This is on an open telephone line. And uh, I said, uh, you know, what had happened? And he said, well, you better call your friends in Chinese intelligence. At which point on the telephone, I heard, well, me jing ting dala. Uh, so we already heard it. So um, you get used to a certain level of surveillance. But, but leaders, politicians, people at home doing the business of their own people shouldn't have to put up with this kind of thing. Fair enough. Uh, Kirchen, do you want to ask uh, your question about... Let's see. Oh, yeah, this is good. If you want to see it, I have it written down. Yes. Uh, good morning, Ambassador Freeman. Hello. Hello. And uh, I would like to ask a hypothetical question, uh, which is if India, instead of China, is catching up on the U.S., and tries to strengthen its own industry and high value products, et cetera. Will the US treat it as another USSR, Japan or China now? Mm. Thanks. Very good question. Um, uh, my own view is that, uh, as I said, I started my career in India. Um, I have a lot of respect for India and, and an affection for Indian culture, which is a remarkably colorful and varied one, and one with a great history. Um, India um, is usually Americans exaggerate um, the affinities, the connections between India and the United States because of our emphasis on democracy. And we look at India and we say, well, this is a fellow democracy. Uh, well, India has been a democracy. It's becoming much less so as we speak, um, uh, it, um, and I would argue that the Indians never shared our emphasis on democracy as part of their national identity. And we see this now with Hindutva, which is the uh, effort to turn India into a Hindustan uh, rather than uh, a secular state in which Muslims are, uh, and Buddhists, Jains, and others are are comfortable. Um, 
So um, I think the ideological affinities are overstated. Um, and I don't think they're much of a protection against what you just suggested. Um, India has been assertively independent, unwilling to uh, uh, mortgage its future to any other country. Uh, like the United States in our early days, it has avoided entangling alliances. Uh, it had a good relationship with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, uh, but it was not allied with the Soviet Union. Um, it is not allied with the United States, it will not be. Uh, it has its own interests, which don't always correspond with those of the United States. It is possible in the future that we could become uh, if not enemies, at least adversaries or rivals. I suspect we will become rivals. Let me draw a distinction here between three categories of bad relationship. A rivalry is a competition. Uh, rivals, rivals compete primarily uh, to outdo each other. So rivalry implies a healthy competition in which each side is trying to improve its own performance. An adversarial antagonism is something different. Uh, that is a competition in which the parties try to hamstring or damage each other and uh, cripple uh, each other uh, so that they can win, not by improving their own performance, but by degrading that of their opponent. And finally, enmity implies a desire for annihilation, uh, that you really want to destroy the other party completely. Um, the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War had a relationship of enmity, uh, but the fear of nuclear exchange uh, kept us in a position of um, uh, adversarial antagonism, uh, unable to carry out our mutual destruction. Um, India is going to be a rival um, in the future, in my, in my view. It is a potential great power globally. It is the hegemon, uh, the top power in its own region of South Asia. Um, this is why China has a relationship with Pakistan to prevent India from totally dominating uh, the region to the south of, Xinj of uh, Tibet. Uh, so, um, yeah, we could find ourselves with a very troubled relationship with the Indians in the future. Um, the causes of US-China adversarial antagonism now uh, are complicated. Um, and uh, I don't think India would totally replicate them. There's one other factor I would mention and that is this is an interesting one. Um, we have, uh, when I was a kid, which was many, many years ago, um, I didn't even know what an Indian looked like. Uh, there weren't any Indians in the United States. I mean, people from Hindustan. Um, of course, we have American Indians and I'm part American Indian, but um, I didn't even know what an Indian looked like. And um, uh, now we have, I don't know, 4 million Indian Americans. Um, uh, you know, I knew what a Chinese looked like because we had plenty of Chinese. We now have even more, 6% of Americans are of Asian origin now. Um, so we've become more diverse. And the interesting thing is if you look at the Chinese American population and the Indian American population, they are very different in their political behavior. The Indians are hyperactive politically. Uh, there are many Indians now representing their districts in Congress. Some of, actually, some of our better congressmen and women are, are Indian. There are very few Chinese Americans who go into politics. Um, I think uh, the probably Chinese experience uh, 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 inclines them to avoid politics uh, and to seek other outlets. Um, so. Other interesting thing is that both Indians and Chinese in the United States uh, are in the wealthiest category of the population and the highest educated, the most educated. So in a sense, 
to the extent that India can retain the affection of Indian Americans, it has a protection, a political protection that China has not had. Uh, the Chinese population in the United States is divided not just between uh, the old Kuomintang and uh, Kuomintang, uh, but also between Taiwanese and mainlanders uh, who have quite different views of uh, the world. And this means that Chinese don't act cohesively. Indians do. Even Indian Muslims join their Hindu uh, fellow uh, Indians in taking common positions on, on issues. And from what I, I hear from uh, some Indian friends, unfortunately, a lot of the funding for the Hindutva project uh, comes from the U.S. But anyway, yeah, we, we have extremists uh, in every immigrant population or population with overseas connections. We have a certain number of extremists, and sometimes they act very destructively. Hi, sir. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, what do you think the meaning of the Meng Wanzhou coming back to China is for U.S. and China relations? And, you know, the similar things happen in Japan and French um, because the Toshiba and the Ostrom yeah. also because high technology threatens the U.S. You know, the uh, Toshiba has uh, advanced semiconductors and the uh, Ostrom has the electricity technology. But Japan and French, uh, France did not ask the U.S. to release employees in such a tough manner as China. I want to know what you thought of the different results of these three similar events. Very good question. Um, I, I would say first on the Meng Wanzhou uh, case that um, uh, I hope both the United States and China have drawn the appropriate lessons from this. Uh, hostage diplomacy doesn't work. Um, I think the United States, in my view, clearly treated Meng Wanzhou as a hostage uh, in order to gain political leverage on Huawei, uh, which it was trying to um, uh, cripple. Uh, so um, uh, I would say that that's what began this. Uh, China's seizure of two Canadians the so-called two Michaels in retaliation was utterly improper and lawless. Um, and while um, the Canadians are happy that their two hostages have been released and Chinese are happy that Meng Wanzhou is back in Guangzhou um, or Shenzhen or someplace, um, it isn't, um, I don't think anybody gained from this. Um, and I'm glad that the Biden administration uh, released Miss Meng, and I'm equally glad that the Chinese government then released the two, two Michaels. Uh, we have had incidents between France and uh, Japan. Uh, the head of Nissan, who was uh, French Lebanese, uh, uh, was you know, subjected to arrest in Japan. Uh, and managed to escape with the help of a couple of U.S. Special Forces uh, contractors. He was flown out in a crate on a, and is now sitting in Lebanon um, somewhere. Um, uh, so this isn't unprecedented, uh, but I hope it's not, a, not something that we're going to see in the future. Um, the world needs to regain respect for the rights of individuals, even as it regains respect for the sovereignty of foreign countries. I don't like uh, what is happening in this area at present at all. And I don't like the extraterritorial extension of jurisdiction that I see, uh, which China is now doing, copying the United States. Uh, this is an issue that has affected Hong Kong, obviously, uh, because of extradition issues and the like. Um, so it's a bad situation, and um, I don't know what the solution is. But I thank you for asking the question, young lady. Hello, sir. 
my question is, uh, some medium-sized countries usually, usually choose to ban with going with a, uh, with a more powerful state, which, which is obviously in the Cold War competition. Uh, the Soviet Union and the United States had their own bloc. In recent years, China is getting more and more powerful, and we can find that some states seem to use hedging strategy, which means that they depend on China on economy and rely on US in security. Um, where? Uh, seeking relatively independence in great power competition. However, China and the United States relation is becoming increasingly intense. I think the United States is trying to force in their allies like uh, United Kingdom, Japan, uh, to choose only one side in order to create an anti-China group, like a zero-sum game. Uh, so you just mentioned that uh, the world is moving into a new form of order in which medium-sized countries demand, uh, demand more space uh, for their own decision making. So my question is, uh, how will the medium-sized country choose a flexible strategy to persist in pursuing their own uh, interests under the increasing pressure from the great power rivalry? Well, I think you're right. Um, the effect of the Sino-American split uh, is uh, to um, oblige some countries to make choices they don't want to make. Uh, we just heard this very explicitly from the United Arab Emirates, uh, which said that it felt in an awkward position and forced to choose between America and China, which is a choice it doesn't want to make. I don't think anyone wants to make this choice. The good news, as I see it, is that the world is not going to end up as it did in the Cold War with a bipolar, meaning two-part um, dominance. You know, in the Cold War, we had basically two feudal systems, feudal meaning uh, overlords and, uh, and people who owed loyalty to them. We had one centered in Moscow, one centered in Washington. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, China demands a certain degree of deference politically, um, and it confuses that, I think, with respect. Um, and um, the United States uh, hangs on to, the, uh, to a, a model of relations that it learned in the Cold War. Uh, but uh, the world is becoming polycentric. It's becoming, uh, it's developing multiple powers. Uh, earlier, a uh, young man asked a question about India. Uh, India is the center of its own regional state system. Uh, Russia is resurgent. Uh, it is, uh, the Central Asia is coming together in the wake of the Afghanistan debacle. Um, uh, Japan, uh, which has been subservient to the United States, is actually steadily becoming more independent. Uh, so I think smaller, medium-sized countries now have choices uh, that are not limited to China and the United States. And they are indeed, as you suggested, able to hedge, but in multiple directions. A final observation, um, everybody thinks about military versus economic, but there are other dimensions. Um, the, there is the technology dimension. You know, do you want to have Huawei uh, telephone technology, or would you prefer to have Nokia or Ericsson? Um, uh, I actually, uh, in, in uh, uh, the Bahamas, which I occasionally visit, have Huawei equipment and find it very satisfactory. Uh, but um, anyway, we have a technology standards war going on. Parts of the world will have uh, Chinese standards, parts will have other standards, not necessarily American, maybe European, um, maybe Indian. Uh, so uh, the maybe Japanese. Uh, so I think um, uh, if you look at the uh, most countries, uh, you know, for example, France now, um, you know, is trying to consider how to, exactly the question you you raised. Uh, how do they hedge? Uh, they don't like American policies toward Russia. They don't like American policies toward China. 
the formation of the Australia, UK, US AUKUS uh, group um, blindsided them. They don't like that. Um, I notice that the quad, meaning the informal grouping of uh, India, Japan, Australia, and the US, is now trying to reach out to ASEAN and demonstrate respect for ASEAN centrality in Southeast Asian affairs. And I think uh, this is a reaction to the very factors that you mentioned. So I don't, uh, I, I don't think people in the end are gonna have to choose. I think they have multiple choices, not just two. Um, and um, I'm not sure that for the most part, the United States is actually demanding that they choose. Although the effect of our policies is to put choices to them that they would rather not have. China has been more discreet and I think less demanding in this regard. Uh, maybe that will change, but it seems to me to be wise. Oh yeah. Hello, Ambassador Hi. Freeman. Uh, well, my question is about the ideological controversy in Sino-U.S. relations. Uh, Fukuyama proposed the end of history after the Cold War, and some Chinese scholars uh, argue the end of the end of the history uh, in recent years, addressing the rise of China with a, a different uh, ideology and indicating that uh, the a capitalist democracy is not the only answer. So my question is, uh, is China pushed to a competitive position to the US because of different values? And how do you understand the ideological controversy? And what's the role that this kind of difference play in the relationship between two, two countries? Thank you. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, was a Hegelian. Uh, he believed in Hegel's theories of how history uh, moves in response to a dialectic. Um, interestingly, Hegel was the inspiration for Marx and Marxism. Uh, so this is a, a bit uh, of an irony. Uh, Fukuyama was wrong. Uh, history had not come to its final stage as he thought it, it had. The Chinese scholars are right. Um, the end of the end of history is upon us. Uh, I don't think the current struggle between the United States and China is basically ideological or values based, although that is the, admin the Biden administration's position. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, uh, democracies are in trouble everywhere mentioned India, Mr. Modi is doing great damage to India's democracy. Mr. Trump did great damage to American democracy. I would argue that uh, Boris Johnson is doing a lot of damage to British democracy. So democracies are in trouble, but that is because of internal factors, not external factors. The second, the, uh, the, 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 the view that somehow democracy is under assault from an authoritarian ideology, has no empirical evidence to back it. Uh, I know, uh, I, I negotiated over the course of my career in 140 different countries around the world. Um, I know a lot of autocrats, authoritarians, kings, generals, dictators, communist party general secretaries, and the like, um, presidents, prime ministers. What they have in common is a desire to retain power for themselves. They don't feel any kinship or connection to other authoritarians. So there is no ideology of authoritarianism to unite the enemies of democracy. The enemies of democracy are inside. Now, the U.S.-China uh, competition, adversarial antagonism, as I put it at the moment, is based on a number of factors. 
Uh, one is the eclipse of the United States, uh, which has been the, the, large, the, the leading economic power for 150 years, and which is losing that position. Um, I don't believe that GDP is a valid com uh, comparison between national economies. So if you look at, say, the industrial economy, manufacturing in China, the United States, you find that China is twice as large as the United States. In some contexts, that's much more relevant than that the United States has a larger insurance industry. Um, so um, I would argue that um, uh, the economic disparities, the American sense that China is uh, becoming greater than it in, in than the United States in economic terms is disquieting, it's psychologically disturbing. Um, the sense that democracy is in trouble uh, invites people to blame others. We all have a hard time acknowledging our own faults and it's much easier to blame our neighbor or someone else uh, for having caused whatever difficulties we do. Um, our political system in the United States at the moment is in grave difficulty. Part of the reason for that is social media. Um, the, 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 the business plans for social media and Facebook and um, or wasting or you know all, uh, the, uh, these are these these uh, companies have a business plan which depends on grouping people by their prejudices, what they like and don't like, and then using that knowledge to sell goods and services, advertising. Uh, and so, um, so if you um, if you don't find people, if you if you're somebody who believes that there are trolls under the Hong Kong Harbor hiding in the highway, uh, Facebook will help you find other people who believe the same nonsense, um, and they will use that. So this has created a, uh, an atmosphere that is perfect for the hatching of conspiracy theories. And we have lots of them. And at the moment, the United States, in my view, is a bit hysterical. I noticed that the Chinese government, the party, is trying to address this very problem in, in a way that's perhaps the wrong way, but they too are concerned about the growth and the power of oligopolies like Alibaba, Tongxin, uh, etc., um, at, the, at the expense of the state. Um, a great deal of communication is now done online, and sub communities are being formed uh, that may not agree with the national vision uh, and may not even uh, have much. Uh, gra a grip on reality. So the Chinese have the same problem we do. And um, uh, we are not trying to do very much about it, although there's a lot of congressional uh, hearing about it, hearings about it. Nobody's come up with an answer that's compatible with free speech. China is not so concerned about free speech. So um, I would say the US-China competition is partly geopolitical. Um, China obviously doesn't want uh, the United States asserting a sphere of influence that goes right up to its border, uh, but it's also psychological. Uh, and China has its own psychology in this regard. Uh, China has, for 150 years, China has celebrated its victimization by outside world imperialists. European, American, Japanese. Uh, China is, behaves, uh, has been conditioned to behave like a weak and vulnerable country. But China is no longer weak and vulnerable. It's no longer poor. It's a middle income country. It has a very strong military. There's nobody who would dare to invade China. Um, 
And China has not adjusted psychologically to the fact that it is now strong. Uh, so this is a problem in Chinese diplomacy. Very often, uh, Chinese don't seem to understand that other countries fear them, fear China. Um, so uh, I used to have a lot of conversations with Deng Xiaoping about this years ago. Uh, I think there are psychological problems on both sides. Uh, and I, I don't know what the cure is. Hi, good morning, Ambassador Freeman. Nice to meet you and thanks for sharing. And I would like to have a question about will Biden continue the foreign and national security policy of Trump in his presidency? Or will it depend on how aggressive China is over economic issues and foreign affairs? And the second question is, could Taiwan and the South China Sea issue really cause a hot war between the US and China? Thank you. To, to, uh two related questions, really. Um, uh, on the first, I think um, the Biden foreign policy generally, and including with regard to China, is a projection of domestic politics. Uh, Mr. Biden has a no majority in the Senate. He has a very small majority in the House. He has legislation he wants to get through. He does not want to give the Republicans or Democratic opponents within his own party an excuse to be non-cooperative or to, to attack him. Uh, so this is why you see things like um, Catherine Dye's um, statement, uh, what was it, uh, yesterday, the day before, um, about China trade policy, where basically she said she was going to stick with the Trump policy overall, but make some minor adjustments. My interpretation of that was that she knows that Biden does not have the support for a different policy, but the policies are wrong. So she's going to proclaim that strategically she will stick with the Trump policies while tactically she will undermine them in discussions with Liu He. So this is a political stance, not a not a strategic stance. Anyway, um, so I'd argue that um, Mr. Biden will not be able to deviate from Mr. Trump's policies toward China or much else, um, uh, unless and until uh, the 2022 midterm elections give him more support in the legislative branch. Um, with regard to whether Taiwan or the South China Sea issues could cause a war? I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't think the South China Sea is likely to do so. Um, that's a very tangled issue, uh, bound up with a number of things. Um, for example, uh, prior to uh, uh, the end of the 19th century, uh, China did not have a concept of sovereignty to Chuan similar to that of the West. Uh, the Chinese concept was loyalty to the emperor. It was personal. The Western concept is territorial control. So this is why you get an argument over Diao Yudao, for example. Um, you know, the Japanese embraced the Western notion. There are no people on Diao Yudao. So the Chinese concept of sovereignty didn't apply and Japan applied the Western concept and took the islands. Um, and the same thing complicated the South China Sea. The first Chinese map to show claims to the islands in the South China Sea that I've seen was printed in 1914 in Beijing and uh, then called Beijing. And um, uh, the nine dash line originated with an 11 dash line drawn by the Kuomintang government in Nanjing in 1947, um, simplified later by the, PR, the People's Republic. Um, so uh, these are issues. Um, China was prevented from asserting sovereignty uh, during the most of the 20th century because of its weakness, because of the Cold War, because of US containment policies, uh, but um, in the 1980s, the end of the 1970s and the early 
1980s, every, everyone else began to uh, assert their claims. Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, uh, all took islands in the region. China reacted in 1987, 1988 um, by seizing its own. Uh, it got what was left. Um, what was left was insignificant and China has built artificial islands to make it significant. Uh, it will not be dislodged from the South China Sea. But I think this is a problem that is essentially manageable. And I think it will be managed. Taiwan is a different matter. Um, I ask myself, what was the purpose of the two Chinese revolutions in the 20th century? Uh, the Xinhai Keming in 1911, uh, the 1949 communist revolution, um, both had as their objectives, the ending of foreign spheres of influence on Chinese territory, the ending of warlordism, meaning uh, local authorities in, who defied the central authority, whether they were democratically elected or self-appointed didn't matter. Um, uh, and uh, the unification of the country under a single sovereignty and the restoration of Chinese territorial integrity. Uh, Taiwan is a daily reminder to people on the mainland of the humiliation China underwent, particularly by Japan, uh, and of the presence on Chinese territory of a foreign sphere of influence, namely Taiwan's relationship with the United States. Uh, it is also a reminder that the civil war is not over. Uh, the Civil War was suspended when the Seventh Fleet entered the Taiwan Strait on June 27, 1950, during the Korean War to prevent uh, Chiang Kai-shek from attacking the mainland or Mao Zedong from attacking Taiwan. That suspended the war. It didn't end it. And it's now entered a new form. So I think this is an issue of great importance to Chinese nationalism. And I think China has been quite clear that while it would strongly prefer a peaceful resolution, if it must, it will use force to solve it. Um, I'm sorry to say that uh, the danger of war seems to me to be steadily increasing. Um, and um, the evidence that China is acknowledging this is to be found in part in the buildup of Chinese nuclear forces that we're seeing. Uh, China has had a nuclear policy of no first use. In other words, it would absorb an attack and then respond. And its nuclear forces were sized to support this strategy. That was a good strategy when the problem was a possible American or Soviet attack. It's not a relevant strategy if you plan to carry out a military operation against Taiwan and have to deter the United States from intervening. And I think what is happening is China is building a nuclear force with which it can deter the United States from intervention if it has to use force against Taiwan. Uh, I have a, I think probably in November, I'm going to give a talk that outlines in detail what this may mean in political military terms, but I'm not gonna do that today. Uh, still, um, the framework for managing the Taiwan issue, which was US recognition of one China, uh, no support for Taiwan independence uh, is broken. Um, most people, most Americans believe Taiwan's a separate country. The history has been forgotten. The commitments the United States made have also been forgotten. And Taiwan is in the hands of a pro-independence party whose leader, Tsai Ing-wen, is very clever and sly, whose foreign minister, Wu, is not clever or sly, but very open in advocating Taiwan's status as a separate country. Uh, so uh, this is a problem. It is a direct challenge to Chinese nationalism and to the pride of the United States and to the American sense of obligation to friends. And it 
looks to me like a train wreck about to happen. I certainly hope not. Um, we've you've been very generous with your with your time, Ambassador. I don't know if uh, uh, if you have anything else to to do at the moment, or if you have time to answer one more student question. One more, and then I'm we'll go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. The masked lady. My goodness, another one. <laughs> Um, so you're obviously one of the most uh, experienced diplomat in China. You were there in Nixon's visit, and you're very experienced in intelligence service as well. So um, I know national security people look at things at the lens of national interest. So my question is, when we always talk about the rise of China would harm U.S. interest, what exactly are those interests are we talking about there? Are we talking about more uh, vague interests like influence or are we talking about more tangible interest? And there's a part two of my question. The part two of my question is that compared to the last Cold War, are we talking about similar national interests there or are we talking about diff different interests? Thank you. It's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, um, the concrete uh, harm to the United States from China's rise uh, is very hard to quantify or, or identify. Um, there are various theories, which I think are wrong, that China's uh, dominance of international trade has cost jobs in the United States. I don't think that's true. Um, I think for the most part, manufacturing jobs in the United States, which are now only 8% of Americans work in industry, 8%. Um, this is mostly a product of capital substituting for labor, just as it did with agriculture. You know, in 100, uh, 200 years ago, 200 years ago, 85% uh, of Americans worked on farms. Um, now it's less than one half of 1%. And yet we produce more food. And this is because technology and capital have replaced the need for labor. And the same thing is happening in the manufacturing sector, not just in the United States, but everywhere. Uh, so I think it's wrong to blame China for the, the loss of jobs, uh, but that is one of the charges that is made. Um, concrete interests, I don't see that China has any real ambitions for territory beyond the recovery of Taiwan. Um, and I note that China has been willing to settle border disputes with other countries on a fairly generous basis, um, including countries that are not easy to deal with, like Vietnam. Um, it's been willing to settle the Indian border since 1954, when Zhou Enlai first proposed a swap of Chinese claims in the East for Indian claims in the West, um, or vice versa. Um, so, um, I don't think there is uh, much evidence that um, uh, China is expansionist territorially. Uh, I don't detect any great interest in China in having more Korean Chinese. Uh, so I don't think China is a threat to Korea, although Koreans, Korean, Korea has been invaded 72 times in its history, uh, most of them from the north, from what is now China. Uh, so, uh, one can understand the apprehensions of neighbors, but concrete interests being damaged, it's hard to find any. So I think you're right. Uh, the effect is reduced American influence uh, as Chinese influence grows. Um, it is therefore reduced prestige, perhaps. Um, prestige being the shadow that is cast by power. Uh, it is um, therefore damaging to American self-regard uh, and self-esteem, maybe. Um, so uh, I, don't, I, I don't really don't think this is about, this is so much a contest of, a contest of national interest. It's, it's mainly because the United States has enjoyed primacy and wants to continue to enjoy it. And China has been put down and wants to come back. 
uh, and this produces an interesting uh, interaction. And I'm sorry, the second part of your question was the best, and I've now forgotten what it was. Can you remind me? I was asking, compared to the last Cold War, are we talking about similar national interest? No, this is very different. Um, first of all, as someone earlier mentioned, the Cold War was fought between blocks of countries um, who lined up behind uh, overlords, Soviet or American. Um, there, was an in, there was an intermediate zone of non-aligned countries who tried to hedge against having to join either bloc um, and were partially successful. Um, but uh, this is not a contest between blocs. Um, the United States sometimes seems to uh, believe that the so-called free world, meaning a block of countries associated with the United States, still exists. I don't think it does. I think countries, as someone else asked, uh, um, middle-ranking countries, are, are seeking greater independence and are hedging. And um, uh, there's, not, uh, there's not an American bloc. There's not an automatic followership for the United States anymore the way there was. Now, China doesn't have a bloc. Uh, China doesn't have allies. Uh, China has a protected state in North Korea. It's a buffer state between China and US forces in South Korea and between China and Japan. Uh, this is something that Chinese history makes perfectly understandable, even though the North Korean regime, in my view, is an abomination. Um, it is a plague. It is a cancer on Northeast Asia. Um, China has a relationship with Pakistan. It is also not an alliance. It is driven, as I said, by a desire to deny India total control of South Asia. Uh, the Chinese view appears to be that alliances are not assets. They don't add to your power. They are liabilities. They raise risks. Your ally may do something that gets you into a war that you don't want to be in. Um, and in fact, going back to the Taiwan problem, uh, that is exactly the issue. The more the United States stands with Taiwan, the greater the risks people in Taipei are prepared to take because they assume that if the risks occur, that the United States will absorb them and act on their behalf. So they don't do very much for themselves. They depend on the support of a great power outside. So China may have a point. Anyway, it doesn't have a block. It doesn't have allies. Uh, it is very realistic and restrained in its relationships with other countries. You can see this in the Middle East where China has assiduously avoided becoming embroiled in other people's quarrels. It has a good relationship with Israel. It has a good relationship with the Palestinians. It has a fine relationship with the Gulf Arabs. And it also has a great relationship with Iran. This is quite an achievement. Uh, it is putting diplomacy rather than the military first. Uh, so um, uh, I think this is not another Cold War. The differences are very great. I don't believe there is an ideological contest as there was in the Cold War. Uh, I don't believe that as in the Cold War basically united values and geopolitics. You couldn't distinguish between them. The Soviet Union represented a geopolitical and a values threat to the United States and vice versa. This is not the case with China. Values and interests are now once again distinct. Um, and those of us who do pay a great deal of attention to national interests need to be very careful not to confuse them with psychological attitudes or uh, values preferences. So I thank you for asking. That's a terrific question. And it goes right to the heart of where uh, Francis Fukuyama's renewed history is going. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador. Well, okay. Thank you. And I will get off and let you go back to whatever you're doing. 
Absolutely. I, I was just going to, I mean, this is not a real question, but I, I was going to ask how it was that you escaped the intellectual fate that has befallen the blob and the foreign policy establishment in DC. But I guess that will uh, remain a secret. It, it, it must because we've run out of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, have a good morning and uh, thank you again. Uh, I appreciate it greatly. I'm glad to have been of help if I have been. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.